Hello and welcome everyone to uh, this keynote panel for Placer Discover, our first ever annual event. We are so excited that you're here with us today. We have a really amazing panel to discuss some of the biggest trends that are going to define retail in the coming and retail real estate in the coming year. Uh, thrilled to be joined by an expert panel, uh, including uh, Sandy Siegel, Daniel Taub, and Deborah Weinswig. Thank you guys so much for joining us. It's so great to have you here today. We have a lot we want to cover, so I'm gonna, we're going to dive right in, in terms of trying to figure out really where is the sector going, what are the big things that you need to be aware of, and how do we expect it to move forward? And I think one of the really important starting points is which of these trends do we really think are going to carry the day as we head into a new year? And Sandy, I'll start with you here. What do you think the biggest retail trend is to be tracking heading into 2022? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> clearly we're looking we're, we're looking at three things. I, I think I think we're looking at sentiment. In other words, what do people feel when they go to our centers? Um, do they do they show up when when they feel that way? What is their propensity to stay at our at our at our shopping centers? And then you know, do they buy right? And so for us, we want to know that our our customers are feeling fulfilled, that they spend the time at our centers and that they, I'm um, at the end of the day, buy. And obviously that depends on, um, you know, a few, few things, customer service, labor, um, our ability to connect with, with our customer, and obviously having the things that uh, people want to buy and, and uh, bring home. Daniel, same question for you. What, do you. what is the big retail trend that you're looking at to have a huge impact in 2022? So, you. There were a lot of things that were going on in retail before COVID that have benefited, uh, ironically enough, as a result of COVID. And I think that what what the trend is, is how does the retailer look to evolve and innovate where they were forced to as a result of the impacts of COVID? How do they continue to maintain that innovation so that they can be relevant to the consumer, where, how, when the consumer wants to shop, whether it is online or physical in some combination, and how do they deliver that so that they are just not a, a physical store and opening their doors? And so I think it's, will there be a, will, will this create a, a new generation of innovation in established retailers as well as newer retailers um, in order to embrace moving faster because the consumer is moving faster relative to how they want to consume either goods or services. I mean, it's such an important point. And actually, I mean, Deborah, this is an area that you, you speak about quite a bit in terms of the, the moves to innovation and especially on the technology side within the retail space. Sa same question for you as well. If, if you had to define what that big retail trend is to, tra to be tracking for next year, what would it be? We always have to have three, but but actually to kind of carry on from, from Daniel's comments. So number one is, right, this whole instant need space. And we're sizing right now at about a $25 billion industry. So if you're thinking of the, the door dashes and the instant carts, but now you've got, right, I mean, in Manhattan, you know, you got to, like, when you cross the street, and you got to make sure that, uh, you know, <laughs> you're not battling a bike. Um, and you've got GoPuff, Gorillas, Get Here, 15, 20, Fridge No More, et cetera, et cetera, bike. And so that whole space is growing exponentially. And, it, you know, it's this idea that the consumer wants it and they want it in 15 to 20 minutes. And so being able to deliver that, I think, is critical. Number two is this C to M, customer to manufacturer, or on-demand manufacturing. So it's this idea around kind of mass customization or personalization. And, you know, we are, you know, especially with some of the supply chain challenges, I would say this topic is uh, front and center. And then lastly, live streaming, live commerce, which, you know, from our experience in China, right, the mall is really the center for that. And what we've continued to see is, you know, retailers around the world who are building kind of stages or utilizing their stores, you know, especially as we're seeing kind of the mall as a platform develop. So those would be the three that I'm looking for in 22. And those are, those are some really big ones. And I think one of the areas that we kind of looked at to try and understand where things are going is what people did and especially which brands did things that really excited us. So for me, I don't know, one of the brands that took the last year, if not year and a half, is just Best Buy. Their ability to move to curbside, their appointment shopping when the recovery was just beginning last May, all these decisions just seem so far 
ahead of the curve. You know, Deborah, I'll start with you here as we kind of swing around. Is there a brand that in the brick and mortar space that really impressed you in the last year and, and why? I mean, I, I have to say I'm going to, I mean, if I were to pick a, I'll pick more of a category with the department stores because I think that everyone had, had written them off. And I personally write, you know, it's still that kind of, I was thinking of like this Disney world and right, like I expect all this magic. And I, I think that they really, I mean, I think that the innovation, the, the quick decisions, I mean, we're seeing a live streaming from, from many of them. I mean, it really is amazing. And then if you look at the census data, right, for sales from today, I mean, the, the growth that we've seen in this sector, I would say is kind of what's somewhat unparalleled. And, you know, I think it's this, you know, there, there, there is something magical. And I think it's not just being kind of the, the anchors for many of these malls, but there, there's memories that are created there. They're, you know, they're really kind of critical, I think, to the landscape. And we are finally starting to see, right, kind of innovation at a whole new level, whether it's shop and shops, which are at levels I would never have expected. And so that's helping to kind of boost their, you know, kind of top line and bottom line. But I think it's also just that, right, how consumers want to consume and especially, right, like Gen Z, right? I mean, it's like, you know, the mall is like the hippest destination right now. And so I think that, you know, with the kind of department stores being the, the foray into that. So I will say that I think much of what we've seen has been unexpected. Um, but at the same time, right, the, the data kind of backs that all up. And so, you know, you, you look at the numbers for this most recent month in the, the department store space. And they were up 27.6% year on year, according to the data released today. I mean, those are big numbers, no matter how you slice it or dice it. I, I mean, I think it's a great one. It also kind of surprising because obviously pre-pandemic, we knew we'd be talking about department stores as the big winner. <laughs> uh, Sandy, same question, a, a brand, a chain that really impressed you in the last year, and uh, what did they do to do that? Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> I always use Best Buy, frankly, as, as one example, and um, they were ahead of the curve because because you watched in the electronic space one by one, the competitors going out of business, and you saw, um, you know, that the march was just leading right to Best Buy's front door, and they, they nailed it as far as I'm concerned, which is, you know, providing uh, the Geek Squad as a connectivity point and a service point, um, being the low price leader and ma matching prices, and, and either delivering the product to, to your door, to the curbside, or to, um, you know, to, to uh, you can come, come in and shop. And, and so for me, um, that sort of leads the way, leads the way forward. Um, I like discovery stores. So I, I love, uh, I love Five Below, um, even though, um, you know, Ross's and uh, Marshall's and that, those, those elk don't have really an online presence, the discovery idea that you can go in, discover, and things change. Um, I think is, is really, really, really compelling. You know, look, what I, what I look at is does the brand inspire both the head and the heart, okay? And do you feel a certain way when you're there? And to Deborah's point, I think memory making is something we do at, at, in physical retail, which you don't do online. Um, and um, I think that the brands that take advantage of that are the ones that are going to succeed. Uh, that's a, a fantastic point, and that, I'm, I'm happy someone agrees with me on, on a brand to, to like. <laughs> Daniel, last, same question for you. The brand that really kind of, you know, inspired you this year. Um, well, it actually started pre-pandemic, but I think what they did during pandemic uh, was kind of the exclamation point, and that's Target. Um, they made a bet before COVID regarding investing a significant amount of billions of dollars in their physical retail, <clears throat> excuse me, which was paying off huge dividends uh, before COVID and actually benefited them as it relates to making the stores more appealing, redesigning the stores, playing to how the consumer needed to shop and or return, pick up online, buy in and store, um, creating multiple small store formats to reach different targeted audiences with a really robust um, utilization of data from a supply chain management in order to make sure goods got to those locations. Um, I think that those, you know, both before and during were probably some of the more impressive um, and forefront relative to both physical and online. And I think that they moved for a chain so large they moved very quickly 
um, throughout the pandemic. And their variety of goods and their, their, if you look at the breadth from grocery to electronics to physical uh, fitness equipment, et cetera, um, they really touched on where the consumer was looking for certain types of goods and services throughout the, you know, the, 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 the hardcore part of the pandemic. Ethan, if I could point. maybe jump in Go. on Five Below, I think that that was a really interesting one to bring up because they actually were deemed essential, but they decided to close so that they could kind of, you know, get everything, that their house in order. And when you think about that from a decision perspective, I, I, I mean, I, there were a lot of interesting things during the pandemic that really stood out to me because then when they kind of opened, they were able to hit the ground running. I, I think it actually has been to me a, as I think about the company, probably completely changed their longer term trajectory, not just their shorter term one. Don't you think, Daniel? Spot on. Um, it, it, it really was, um, having, having spoken with few of their real estate people, it really allowed them to refocus on, on the operational side of the business, but also what their plan was going to be working through it. And, They've gotten back on track probably as fast as anybody else from a real estate perspective relative to their rollout and they're continuing to expand their business as well as great merchandising and operations on, on the, on the uh, retail side of it. I think that the important point is that with all the brands we're talking about is really decisive decision, like decision making, a clear idea of what they wanted to accomplish, not kind of waiting it out, but having a real sense of what they were looking to do. And, you know, even Daniel, to your earlier point, you know, we talked about you know, innovation as one of these key themes. And you think about how much Target, Best Buy, others invested in these ideas that paid off so so much during the pandemic. It's not magic. It's really thinking about where the future is going and having these assets ready so that when the moment strikes, you're prepared to meet the customer where they want to be met. And, and Daniel, I, I want to stay with you because I think one of the things, when we talk about all these trends, we think about a lot of the things that we heard that didn't end up being all that true. So, you know, we talked to people about, uh, you know, that's it. Peloton is going to take over fitness. Goodbye, gyms. And we've seen in the last few months that's certainly not a simple uh, story. So I wonder what you think is the biggest, let's call it false narrative, that we need to avoid overreacting to. I, I think, again, I think it's a pre-pandemic one that the pandemic accentuated, which was that we are, that, that we are moving in in masses to moving from traditional physical retail consumption to an online only world. Um, I think that while online benefit, certain online benefited as a result of our limitations in terms of where and what we could do, I think you've started to see that revert back more to the norm in terms of what our pre pandemic shopping behaviors were like uh, for most categories. Um, and <clears throat> The reality is, is that the data, and, and Deborah can probably speak to this best out of anybody, the data shows that, that there is this, this harmony between physical and online. It's not an either or. They're not working against each other. In fact, they work much better when done well and execute well. They actually enhance and rise uh, the tie for everything for the brand if they can do both of those in harmony. So I think it's the fact that, oh my God, e-commerce, e online, we're never going to go back to shopping in physical. We're always going to use X, Y, Z, and we're, we're never going to leave our couch. I think that was pre-pandemic, exacerbated by the pandemic. And I think we're starting to see, you know, again, a reversion to the norm, which is, which is really what retail has done when you look at historical cyclical events. Deborah, same question. Is there is there a, a trend that you think has been overhyped and likely to you know regress back? Hmm, overhyped. Um, I think if anything, there are some that are underhyped. Um, so if I can take the the other side, right? So I mean, I'm gonna like you know, I mean, I'm I'm so obsessed right now with live streaming because I I still fundamentally don't understand how we have an industry that's 300 billion plus in China and we're like going to be lucky if we're kind of $10 billion here this year. And the reason it's such an important category, first of all, it's phenomenal for kind of physical real estate, right? And it, it's a it's a new channel, right? There's, I look at there's kind of offline, online, and then there's live streaming. And this is basically bringing e-commerce to life, if you will, in a physical environment. But returns are reduced 50%. 
right? Because you can ask the influencer, KOL, whoever's on the other side, the host, co-host, kind of about the product, the color, the fit, the this, the that. And so, so that's number one. Number two, it allows you like this whole new kind of discovery mechanism. And, and then number three, if we think about kind of the, the opportunity for kind of you're, you're literally starting to bring the mall or the bring physical to life in a whole new way. And, you know, what we've seen is actually in um, Sweden, there's one of the platforms called Bambuzzer. They literally have partnered up with several malls. So basically you order something and then if you physically go and pick it up, they give you a cup of coffee. And what they've seen, it's it's amazing what people value that cup of coffee at. But I think it's it, it's like the little stuff that gets people to go into physical. It's just sometimes they have to be reminded. And so I think that that is a very kind of underhyped opportunity. And one I think that, you know, whether it's exponential in 23 or 24, I think there's there's still some of it is the, the foundation that's that's being laid. But I do feel from a physical perspective that, you know, we're starting to see actually some malls who are hosting events. I'm, I'm, I couldn't be more excited. Sandy, same question. Is there a narrative that you've seen that you are not getting caught up in and looking to avoid, you know, I guess, buying into over the next year? Okay. Well, I mean, there's, I've heard the retail's dead, so I'll, I'll pick up on, on Daniel's point, and um, this retail is dead narrative. Any of us who've been in this business for multiple years were, you know, we were in the narrative when, um, you know, when Big Box was going to, you know, kill everybody, and Walmart was going to kill everybody, and the internet's going to kill everybody, and COVID's going to kill everybody, um, and and the reality is um, COVID actually proved the the would provide the opposite argument. COVID provided that even if you raise friction to the level that you could, you'd be safe at home, but you'd be much more at risk if you went outside. Large numbers of people, you know, dramatic number of people still went out and shopped, okay? The, the desire to connect and the desire, you know, the human um, DNA that says we're hunter-gatherers is, is a real thing. Now, what we discovered is, you know, we need to adjust friction point. And, and again, I'll go to Daniel's point, which I totally agree with, which is that we tend to buy into this narrative, which the media pushes all the time, right? Which is you're either, you know, internet, um, you're either an online or, or a bricks and mortar business. And that turned out not to be true at all. And when the good retailers that have taken advantage of the fact that they can reduce friction, but um, provide physical experiences, I think um, proved that people want that in, in abundance. And, you know, I, I think the the connectivity, the better we do as operators to connect our communities to our centers. Um, and I think we really did do that during COVID. I think you're going to see, um, you know, our, our retailers be rewarded for that. So, um, you know, now, now look, I'm in, I'm in the shopping center business. That's all I've done my entire life. So you could say I'm a little bit jaded, but you know, because of Placer and other, other data we have, this is what's showing us people when given the choice, will go out and shop. I mean, obviously, we, we clearly agree with that, that sentiment as well. I think one of the things that you touch on is so important is this idea that, you know, and Daniel, I think you used the terminology effectively, this idea of the harmony between them. I think we, we have done this very strange thing, and there's a brand or two that seem to be following that narrative that these are separate entities, as opposed to multiple channels to create a better ultimate experience for the customer and to make me make things better for me throughout my life cycle as a customer of a specific brand. I think, you know, we think about a year, though, that was so defined by uncertainty. I think, you know, it's interesting, you know, you bring up this point, Sandy, one of the things we looked at that we thought was really interesting was, you know, amid the talk of offline versus online, these digitally native companies expanding their offline footprint really significantly as a key mechanism to their to their future growth. I wonder if there was anything that really surprised you, and Sandy, I'll start with you on this one, that really surprised you within the retail landscape over the last year. Well, I mean, I think a few things surprised us. I mean, to, to your point, by the way, um, you only have to look at the biggest retailer, um, online retailer in the world is Amazon, and see their commitment to building bricks and mortar stores to realize that someone smart who's pretty vested in one business understands that there's a connectivity to a bricks and mortar uh, world. And and I think we're seeing we're, we're seeing that in, in real time. I think, you know, you know, I would say it's a, it surprised us, although, it, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting thing. If you look at the success of the dollar stores as an example, OK, um, you know, 
the, you know, the grocery stores, I, you, you could sort of understand. The dollar stores, you'd think they only served as, um, you'd think they would have only served as substitute grocery stores because that was the intention. But, but people went there because they wanted to shop. They wanted to go out and they wanted to spend time not in their house, okay? And they wanted to gather. Um, and we saw our traffic at our dollar stores go absolutely crazy, um, even sometimes rivaling what was going on in our grocery stores. So, um, you know, I, th I think, again, and, and, you know, you kind of hear the theme, I think discovery is a big part of what, what we want to do. And, you know, look, you know, when you online, you know, I, we talked before, you know, I have a puppy and I want dog food. I'm going to, if I, once I find dog food, I'm going to, I can buy it online. I can deliver it to the house. Okay. But to go ahead and take, you know, the dog and, you know, buy, buy the collar or, or, or buy something that's more personalized or individualized, I'm going to the store. And, um, and, and that's just, that's just something that, that connectivity is super important. And that's why, you know, if you look at, take uh, PetSmart as an example, you know, they're, you know, they save themselves off their online business. So you're, you're, you're seeing that connectivity as when retailers use it properly as really uh, um, very heavy coexistence. It's, it's, a, it's a really important point. I, I, I completely agree. I think also, you know, a shout out to our friend Steve Dennis, because we did use his uh, harmonized retail terminology quite heavily. So Steve, we're always thinking about you and thank you for, for figuring out how to express that as effectively as you have. Uh, Daniel, I, I want to ask you the this, this same thing. What, what was some big, the big surprise for you in the last year from a retail perspective? I think it actually wasn't a retailer or, or the real estate. I think it was the consumer. Uh, quite frankly, which was we we went, you know, virtually shut down, um, and the the rebound of the retail the the consumer, excuse me, I think happened faster than anybody would have anticipated. Um, I think to Sandy's point, if you've been in the industry and you've gone through cycles, you know we do rebound and we recover, and in many instances we've learned lessons as we come back bigger, better, and stronger. I think the fact that we rebounded as quickly as we did, especially in certain categories when, depending upon where you were geographically, uh, between what was open and what wasn't, weather and, 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 and other conditions, I think it was the, the return of the consumer was, was a lot faster. And therefore, I think it caught a lot of retailers off guard, uh, uh, you know, in, in conjunction with a lot of the other issues that we're facing most importantly, or most most noticeably, is the supply chain. But the biggest surprise for me was how fast the consumer came back. We knew there was pent up demand, but I think the speed and the velocity was was what surprised me the most. Deborah, for, for you, what was the big surprise? Well, I wanted to pick up with you know kind of what was just said is around supply chain. Actually, I think that you know as we were starting to see things, I would say you know less than stellar that retailers didn't move faster to either secure warehouse space, drivers, you know, I, I always call it kind of like cotton field to consumer and every kind of node in between. And, you know, who would think that we'd be coming into a holiday season right off of a, you know, kind of a crisis um, with not having enough product to sell. And I guess, you know, I, I am predicting as of now, we'll have the greatest gross margins that we've ever had in retail history. But at the same time, if there was more product available, I think we, you know, we could be selling more. And also, I think that, you know, the other surprise is just how long this is taking to, you know, kind of write itself. But in, in some cases, right, the, these MFCs that we're starting to see show up in some of the malls and, you know, this, you know, I would say the whole like BOPIS curbside pickup, you know, new ways to get the consumer to consume and some of the technology that's there to support it, I, I feel like that is, and even just how the malls, right, they were so fast in terms of, you know, kind of allocating parking spaces and, you know, kind of around GPS and whatnot. I, I just feel like, you know, we've made it more experiential, even if it's just how we pick product up. And, I mean, you know, Kroger years ago used to have pickup windows and drive throughs and whatnot, and, you know, kind of those, those went by the way of the, like, horse and buggy whip. But I think that, right, we're starting to see that come back, and I think it, it makes it more fun. And, you know, I just worry right now that, you know, there, there's enough on the shelves. It's, it's, a, it's a very good thing, a real thing to be concerned about, and I think that kind of this supply chain improvement is a, is a really important piece to be following. 
We got a great question that came in uh, about, and, and Sandy, this is based off of your point on discovery as the core when you're thinking about brick and mortar retail. And, and they asked, uh, if physical locations are about, are about discovery and connection at their core, what can retailers do to improve the customer experience in those stores? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, I, I think the number one thing is removing some friction, right? So I think we got we got the positive and the negative. Where we have the positive is, you know, how do you, um, you know, what does the people, what do the people that work at the store mean from a connectivity point to the customer? Okay, and I think this is something I'm very concerned about. I'm actually more concerned about the labor issues than I am about the supply chain. Supply chain work itself out. Labor issues, I'm actually very, you know, pretty concerned about. So, so you know, we spent a lot of time identifying who the people were who worked at our stores and making sure the community knew who they were and that they were local and everything else. So what's that connectivity mean? And then how do we take them through the store to, you know, have them understand what the offerings are and then reduce the friction for them to buy those items and, and get out the door. Um, this is our number one opportunity or our number one threat. Okay. The, the opportunity again, being long-term connectivity, um, this is a store. It matters to the community. It cares about the community. It's part of the community, and I make memories at this place. And then, you know, how do I avoid the customer being disappointed, treated poorly, not recognized, and going there and not getting what they want, and saying, "Screw it, I'll just go go home and I'll shop online." Um, so I think that sort of, sort of grosses it up a bit. No, I think it's it's a, it's a it's a great way of looking at it. I think it's an important way of looking at it. Daniel, I want to go to you for the next question, which is, you know, obviously our perspective is always data, right? And a lot of what we're talking about throughout this kind of Discover event is how is data being better used? How can we use it more effectively? Uh, how do you see data changing the retail real estate lands ecosystem within kind of the coming year? Wow. Uh, well, I think there's so many things that, again, were, were started pre-pandemic. Uh, some some had to pivot during as a result of the pandemic in order to make sure that their businesses could could exist and, and, and survive. I think that there's a few different, I think supply chain, as we talked about, I think, you know, the utilization of data so that retailers can be more uh, effective to understand how to manage their supply chain, both offshore and onshore, relative to uh, their, their goods and products. Um, and having predictive data that will allow them based upon seasonality or geography, uh, depending upon what they're selling in order to be more efficient in that regard. I think you see omni-channel on steroids. Uh, what I mean by that is I think that you see a higher degree of customization in-store utilization between the retailer and the consumer using their phone in order to provide uh, exclusive offerings or tailored offerings. Just how do we become more customized in the balance between the consumer is going to be using your brand. They don't look at it as online, offline. They look at it as your brand. And how do you then translate so that it's seamless, whether they're sitting at their home, in the park, or they're coming to your store, um, including, you know, virtual try-ons. Again, whether you're home and you do it or you're going, you're going for the physical experience, the social experience, the Sandy's point. But yet you don't want to go to a try-on room and you can just use your phone to do a, to do a virtual try-on. Um, I think that there's going to be data <clears throat> that, the, to, to Sandy's point, I think labor is a, a massive in, a issue for the retail retailer landscape. Um, but I think tech not, those, those retailers who embrace technology and data to make their employees smarter and better as a relating pro providing a better customer experience – regardless of their good or service, will be a huge um, opportunity uh, that I think you'll see. Um, and I think that you'll see, um, I think you'll see further enhancement of, from a real estate perspective, is how do we really continue to refine traditional methodology of demographics, traffic patterns, to enhance the real estate location relative to how consumers are shopping as they continue to evolve between that harmonization, that, that, that blending, if you will, between just the brand, not necessarily whether it's a physical or, or an online experience. Uh, that's a really good point. De Deborah, same question. How, how do you see kind of data and the impact of it within that kind of retail real estate landscape? 
I mean, we're seeing now this hyper-localization, right, going back to instant needs. So we did an experiment the other day, because, you know, why not, um, where, you know, kind of one of our teammates who lives like 40 blocks south of me in Manhattan, her kind of local GoPuff had like completely different merchandise than, than the one up kind of uptown by me. And I'm like, because we're all fulfilling out of different warehouses. And I'm like, when you can st- I, when you can start to kind of tailor, right, kind of, product, color, size, everything, I, I feel like that is, right, like talking about utilizing your inventory at a whole different level than you've ever used it in the past, right, and demand forecasting and all that coming into play. So I think that that's fascinating from that perspective, but even more so if we take it one step further, right, this ability to sample or to, you know, kind of start to see what the consumer, right, you know, it can be incredibly expensive, but if you can start to sample with a customer experiment and kind of get real time feedback, I, I feel like that from a data perspective. And then like lastly, along those lines, right, creating product that maybe doesn't exist in the market. So utilizing, right, what consumers are searching for, but maybe not finding. And then kind of building that, you know, build the suit really. And, you know, we've seen a lot of the CPG companies starting to kind of take that on, especially in their own digital transformation. So I think that, you know, the pandemic has really pushed people, you know, kind of to think about, right, in an ideal world, what do they want from retail? And and I feel that while the, the labor shortage is obviously kind of a, a lemons, the lemonade might be, right, more automation and a speed and better utilization of inventory than we've, we've had before. I mean, all one needs to do is look at Japan, right, with their, I would say, critical labor shortage and some of the changes they've made and, you know, we all have a lot to learn from each other. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very important point. Sandy, I want to ask you a, a slight offshoot of that question because, you know, one of the things, you know, Daniel had, had mentioned was kind of using it kind of widely within the organization to help empower kind of, uh, w- uh, you know, teams within retail and beyond. I think one of the things that we talk a lot about is this idea of data accessibility and yeah. how do you make this kind of not a siloed element, but something that can be spread throughout. And I wonder, you know, you as, as a very active user of data, how do you promote behaviors like this to make yeah. data utilization a kind of company-wide priority? No, and then you're, you're, you read my mind because that was going to be my number one point. <clears throat> I think we went from having almost no data to being flooded with data, okay? And this has happened in a relatively short period of time. You see it in the prop tech space. Um, and, it, it, you know, as I, as I think, you know, I started as a programmer and, you know, I'm very data friendly, but I, what I realized was data siloed is really ineffective because there's only so much you can do. And if you go to Deborah's point of hyper localization, there's only so much an executive team can do to pick every micro market and apply it. And so I think there's, there's a couple things that, that come to mind. First of all, I think the role of our property managers and our store managers needs to change. And I think that's going to involve compensation and training. Um, and so, you know, in, in, for instance, in our organization, our property managers know how to use Placer and Merchant Centric and Datex and all these other tools that we use, um, and they get rewarded on doing it. And frankly, we just we're in the middle of all of our budgets for next year, um, you know, which is can be a painful process. But you know, these people when they when they when when our managers report to us, they're not saying, "Listen, I you know I really feel like we need security." Um, you know, you know, 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week, they're saying, here's, here's what we're seeing. Here's when the influx of people are coming here, here, here are the issues. And they're, 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 they're showing us using data. Um, and so I think you have to do that. So I think our technology choices now have to go back to not just what's the best technology, but what's the most accessible technology. For me, that's a very important distinction. I've seen a lot of incredible technology that I can barely understand, so I can only imagine how that, that how that translates at the field level. Um, and two, you got to make that part of your managers or your regional managers how they how they use it to convince you of what actions they should be taking, not the other way around. Um, so um, I just think that's the critical turn that we that we have to make right now. Um, and I think data is the you know what, what I what I tell people is very ironic that something that's so so headspace is data. Can drive can drive the heart space, and I just think that has to happen at a local level. That cannot happen at some ivory tower somewhere. As a, a point I, I could not agree with anymore. I, I think it's, I think it's such an important element towards, 
you know, technology is wonderful, but you know, the technology space is littered with great ideas that never worked out because they, they weren't really all that usable. And I think understanding whether it's you know, data or whether it's microfilament centers or drones, it's how do you find a way to make this stuff valuable and usable? Uh, it's, it's such an important piece of the puzzle. I, I, I want to, I wanna, uh, because we're running a little bit short around time, I want to go to a question that I'm really excited about. So I am going to make all three of you CEO for the day of any company of your choosing. And it can be a dining, retail, entertainment chain, anything you want. And you get to make one big decision. And I want to know what it is and why. And Deborah, I'm going to start with you. You're CEO of any company. Which company? What do you do and why? Hmm. You know, I would. I think that the customer response. So I would pick a, you know, any restaurant chain. Um, and what I would do is, you know, give away whether it's free fries, free burgers, free this, free that. And I think... Think about a loyalty program and, you know, if you get to get the free fries, you have to give them your phone number or whatnot, because I feel like there's so much that's given away, right? And and we never kind of going back to data. And I feel like it's, I don't know if I want to say it's like worse in the restaurant industry where there's greater opportunity is probably the kind of right way to phrase that. But I feel like, right, because I want to know when new products come out and I want to know if there's a special on something in, you know, kind of the restaurant world. And I, I also feel that this kind of interconnectedness, I definitely did not appreciate that between kind of retail and restaurants in like a mall setting until the pandemic. And we worked with many kind of landlords and REITs outside the U.S. because consumers would go to that mall to kind of, you know, oftentimes to, to eat and they'd shop, right? It wasn't, shopping wasn't. And so we started to kind of think about kind of how we could put together, you know, if you will, products that they could order on the, the food side so they could still have a taste of this restaurant or that and to also support the restaurants, you know, when things were closed. But I really started to think a lot about the loyalty around the restaurant industry and that we're, you know, we haven't even scratched the surface, which I guess is like the opportunity and, you know, that I think, so I'd say I want, I want free stuff and I want a loyalty program in the background so that there is an opportunity to develop deeper, better relationships with consumers, but ultimately to make them aware of what's happening with their, their favorite restaurants over time. See, I would do pretty much anything for free French fries. So I'm totally in on that idea. Uh, I'll go next. Daniel, you again, CEO, any company you want, you get to tell me the company, tell me the decision you're making and why. So when I got the question and I was thinking about it, for some reason, I, I automatically said Amazon because they're the 800 pound gorilla. There's a lot of runway, a lot of opportunities, a lot of different ways to play the physical <clears throat> side of the retail. But then as I thought a little bit more, it became very clear to me, and this is motivated really selfishly, having grown up in Southern California, um, I'd be the CEO of In-N-Out Burger. I would... Uh, methodically, but a little bit faster than they have, I will expand across the country in that their loyalty factor is probably as high as any retailer is in anywhere. Um, they, they deliver a phenomenal product. Uh, the menu has barely changed since it started, I think, in 1953. So they've kept it simple. Um, and there's a huge market opportunity for them to grow, uh, even though there's some, some really good national and regional burger chains out there. Um, it's it's simple, uh, but I think uh, you know they've proven to weather a lot of storms, and uh, I think that they they actually provide a great customer experience with a great product, uh, and they keep it very simple. Um, and so for me, it's uh, it became very easy in and out, and uh, the first one would be here in my backyard. <laughs> it's nice seeing people's dreams come out in the open. Sandy, same question. CEO of any company within the brick and mortar space, what what are you doing and why? Yeah, look, I, I, and I'm and maybe this is a little Pollyannish, and this is not particularly um, um, you know um, specific to any one retailer, but I, I would say this: um, if we learn something in the pandemic, is the codependence between the um, the owner of the shopping center and the tenant that's inside the shopping center, um, and you know what, what's what's interesting is somehow we have this sort of adversarial relationship 
I think COVID helped break a lot of that down. If I was if I was a CEO of a retailer, I'd realize that I control what's inside my space. I need a really good relationship with with the people who control the outside of my space, and um, and there's many opportunities for collaboration. Um, and I, so one, I would focus on the landlords who are willing to invest in that collaboration. Um, two, I, I would actively engage because often those those um, landlords know the community better than the, re especially if you're a big chain of the retailer. Um, and I'd find better ways to coexist in the old fashioned idea of what merchants associations and other things used to be. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity there for data sharing, for event sharing, for the opportunity to extend your front door past your physical front door. Um, and, I, and I would look for those opportunities. I know a CEO of a, you know, we have, we have 90 something shopping centers. That's been my goal to work with retailers, but sometimes it's a hard nut to crack. I think COVID showed the dependency we have on each other. And I'd like to see that extended going forward. Uh, great point. I think there's also this element of you know, to go back to what we were saying about data improving accessibility within an organization, it also removes barriers externally as well, because when you can have third party data, it's not this prisoner's dilemma game of hiding everything. There are things that are more out in the open. You can have a different type of conversation. I want to get to kind of the, the last question. We only have a few minutes left. And, and Sandy, I'm going to start with you here. When you are at your absolute most optimistic, mm -hmm. what does retail real estate look like in 2022? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I'm super excited about retail. Okay, and I'm super excited about this convergence. I, I don't, I don't look at you know. There's this discussion is, um, you know, online friend or foe. I think the access to data and the real time access to trends and and how things are happening in more real time, give retail the most amazing opportunity to open up our channels. So, you know, so for me, I say, okay, I got a restaurant, and the restaurant used to only really eighty percent, ninety percent of its business came from people who walked in and sat down. And now that restaurant delivered, uh, learned how to deliver, um, have a delivery system and a much better pickup system and has really now have multiple channels. I, you know, so I could see many ways where people can leverage the store, where the store now becomes the warehouse. So now it becomes easier for them to do online fulfillment when that's what the customer wants and, bring, and actually bring the store to someone's front door, which then encourages that person to come back. So, so I see, you know, a pretty good, opportunity to increase our volume now you know counterbalancing that of course is going to be you know can can these retailers execute some will and some won't and they'll be you know they'll be the land of the lost right and so we'll, we'll have those, those people but i'm super excited that the trends are going the right direction for retail to really be a, a great growth story um and i think uh and i, I could see that that uh, moving forward based on some of what we went through uh, through covid and and the pandemic Amazing. Uh, Daniel, same question. You're most, you're most optimistic. What does retail real estate look like next year? Uh, to echo Sandy, look, I'm a, I'm a retail bull. Uh, I, I, if you look back and you use history as a guide, um, you know, we are a social consumption based society. Um, that is, is in our DNA. Uh, the macro environment sets ourselves up for a very strong 2022. Um, retail is an evolutionary asset class and there's always winners and losers and there's going to be more losers and there's going to be more winners uh, of retailers who exist today and retailers that we don't even know about today. Um, so I think that, you know, that we should be in a growth phase. We've got a huge amount of pent up amount of uh, spending capacity by our by the consumers. Um, we still are in a very low interest rate environment. Um, the fundamentals have challenges. Um, but I think that those will work themselves out as well. Uh, but most categories uh, benefited uh, operationally, uh, technologically, and, and through innovation as a result of, of having to address and having to deal with COVID. So I think 2022 has the ability to, uh, to grow faster and better than we, ever, than we ever thought with some winners and losers, both in terms of retailers and retail asset classes. Um, because we, you know, there's still our challenges, but that's the dynamic nature of retail. Uh, but retail 2022 should, should be a very strong year, uh, building off of hopefully what will be a very strong holiday season based upon all the, the, the estimations and predictions. Agree completely. Hopefully we, we, we bring 2021 to a close with, with kind of a, a boom. And then that just drives straight into the next year. I want to thank, uh, 
Daniel Taub from Marcus and Millichap, Sandy Siegel from Newmark Merrill, and Deborah Weinswig from Corsite. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all so much for being here for this panel. And enjoy the rest of the event. Have a wonderful uh, rest of, I hope you enjoy the rest of the panels. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.